Good evening. I'm Maria Rivas, Publicity Manager at the University of Arizona Press, and I want to welcome you to our event tonight. It's a book release celebration for Beyond Earth's Edge, the Poetry of Space Flight. On behalf of the University of Arizona Press and the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium, I want to thank our co-editors, Christopher Kokinos and Julie Swarstad Johnson for generously sharing their time with us this evening. We also want to thank the staff at, of the Flandreau, our co-host tonight, sharing their webinar platform and generously sharing their planetarium with Julie and Christopher. The University of Arizona Press is the premier publisher of academic, regional, and literary works in the state of Arizona. We disseminate ideas and knowledge of lasting value that enrich understanding, inspire curiosity, and enlighten readers. We advance the University of Arizona's mission by connecting scholarship and creative expression to readers worldwide. Founded in 1959, the press is a nonprofit publisher of scholarly and regional books. We publish about 55 books a year and have more than 1,600 books in print. These include scholarly titles in anthropology, archaeology, environmental science, history, indigenous studies, Latinx studies, Latin American studies, and space sciences, as well as award-winning fiction and poetry in our series, Sun Tracks and Camino del Sol. Beyond Earth's Edge, the Poetry of Space Flight is a trailblazing anthology of poetry that spans from, dawn of the, from the dawn of the space age to the imagined futures of the universe. This book brings science and literature together in just the right intersection, space and poetry, and a, love, a lot of love and heart went into making this book a reality. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the co-chairs of Beyond Earth Sedge. Julie Swarstad Johnson is the author of Pennsylvania Furnace, Editor's Choice Selection for the Unicorn Press first book series, as well as the chapbooks Orchid, Orchard Light and Jumping the Pit. She has served as artist in residence at Gettysburg National Military Park. She lives in Tucson and works at the University of Arizona Poetry Center. Christopher Kokinos is the author of three books of literary nonfiction, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, A Personal Chronicle of Vanished Birds, The Fallen Sky, An Intimate History of Shooting Stars, and Bodies of the Holocene. In 2016, the University of Arizona Press published his co-edited anthology, The Sonoran Desert, A Literary Field Guide, which won a Southwest Book of the Year Award. Coquina's poetry collection, The Underneath, was awarded the New American Press Poetry Prize. He also recently had an op-ed published in the September 27th issue of the Los Angeles Times titled, In Venus Clouds, There's Phosphine. Phosphine stinks, but its discovery lifts my heart. Please welcome Julie and Christopher and help us celebrate this wonderful book. Thank you so much for the introduction, Maggie, and thank you to Shiro for being here tonight behind the camera for us. Before I start, I do just want to take a moment to thank the University of Arizona Press. Um, it's been just wonderful to work with them. We especially want to thank our editor, Kristen Buckles, who's believed in this project from the beginning. We want to thank Maddie again for all of her work on publicity. Thank you to Lee McDonald for her beautiful design inside and out. And thank you to Abby Mogian and Amanda Cross for their work on the book. And thanks to everyone at the press again. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us tonight. It's really a treat to be here to think about poetry and space flight together, and it's good to be imagining you out there at home. Beyond the Sedge is the book that brings together 89 poems about space flight, covering from the launch of Sputnik in 1957 through to the Apollo moon landings, robotic missions, the space shuttle era, onto the present day and into imagined futures. Poets that are included in the book range from US, Pulitzer, U.S. Poets Laureate, Pulitzer Prize winners, and emerging writers, and there's even two poems by astronauts included in the book. It's a book that we hope will provide unexpected perspectives on space flight, and we hope it will both add to your knowledge on this topic, and then it'll lead you to think about it in new ways, 
and ask big and even challenging questions about it. So this book came out of my work here on campus at the Poetry Center. In its earliest iteration, it was a library exhibit at the Poetry Center that if you're here in Tucson, you might have seen. And that exhibit came out of my lifelong love of space. In my daily work at the center, I kept coming across poems about space. And I was really curious about what do poets bring to this topic? What do they have to say? So that exhibit was just a, a smaller sampling of poems. A colleague connected me with Chris, and together we've embarked on the journey of putting together this book, which really covers a lot of territory. And so we're excited to share it with you tonight. So you might be thinking, although maybe not since you're here, you might be thinking, why poetry about space? Like, what does poetry add to our understanding of science? In 2014, when NASA was conducting a test of their Orion spacecraft, they made the decision to include a poem by Maya Angelou on a plaque on board. That poem is titled A Brave and Startling Truth, and you'll find it in Beyond Earth's Edge. Charles Bolden was the NASA administrator at the time, and about this poem, he had this to say about the choice to include it on the spacecraft. He said, quote, through art and the unique perspective of people like Maya Angelou, our discoveries and the new facts and expanded understanding brought to us by exploration are transformed into meaning. So poems, I think, can create meaning by offering us both technical details and the emotional resonances of those details. They can give us intimate snapshots from a life, or they can think about the broad sweep of history. So tonight we'll be sharing poems from throughout the book, thinking about the ways that poets can enrich, challenge, and deepen our understanding of the human quest to know and explore beyond our own planet. So before I hand things over to Chris, I also just want to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Program in Public Understanding. They provided us with a grant that really supported the completion of this book, and it made it possible for us to include some of the more historic poets like Pablo Neruda or Anne Sexton and Allen Ginsberg. And so we're thankful for that. It also allowed us to include an introduction by John Wogston, who's a noted um, space historian and policy expert. And so we're glad to have that grounding for the book. So thanks again to the Sloan Foundation. Finally, I just want to take this chance to thank Chris publicly. It's really been a pleasure to work on this project with him. And I've learned so much from him along the way. So without further ado, here's Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. It's been a pleasure. Um, it, this project has been a, a labor of love for, for both of us, and it's great to count you as a colleague and a friend. Um, I want to extend thanks as well to all, all the folks that um, Julie has mentioned, and in addition, of the poets in, in the book, um, and working with uh, the contemporary poets, working with publishers, um, really was a labor intensive process and I want to thank, we want to thank them as well. Um, I also want to mention before um, I give you a little bit of a sense of what we'll be doing, um, another feature of the book, uh, again, beautifully designed, is a, a gallery of photographs, a color um, glossy gallery of photographs of some of the iconic images of space flight. And that was made possible in part by a grant from the provost office here at the University of Arizona. So I want to acknowledge that as well. So tonight, um, we'll be kind of going back and forth. Um, as Julie gave you a sense of the sweep of this book, it starts with the, the pre-Apollo era back in the late 1950s, early 60s. So I'll read a little bit from our head notes. We have section notes that Julie and I wrote um, in, in each part of the book, uh, starting with the sort of pre-Apollo era, the Sputnik era, and then the Apollo moon landing uh, era in the 1960s. Uh, into the space shuttle era, robotic probes, and even imagining our future in space through some poems that are kind of science fictional. So we'll read from our head notes, our, our little introductory essays, and I'll do that right now with this first section. And then you're gonna hear from some of the poets in the anthology. So this is the um, a little essay called Sputnik and the Race to the Moon. And I'll just read a, a part of this. Origins blossom and recede like fire and smoke from engine exhaust. When does the space age begin, or begin to begin, with Icarus flying too close to the sun, with the Montgolfiers and the first human flights and hot air balloons over astonished crowds in France, with the Wright brothers and those who followed with the rapid development of powered flight higher and higher? Did the space age begin in the imagination of an obscure Russian teacher Konstantin Tilkovsky, 
who foresaw rocket propelled travel outside the atmosphere and with the first crewed mechanical rockets launched by the American Robert Goddard between 1926 and 1941. Where did the space age begin in the imaginations of such writers as Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, each of whom sent humans to the moon in their Victorian era novels? A closer source, the Nazi rocket launches during the last gasps of World War II, when Adolf Hitler ordered V-2 rockets, the first long-range ballistic missiles, to be launched against England and other targets. Those missiles were manufactured and assembled by concentration camp labor with the direct knowledge of Werner von Braun, Arthur Rudolph, and other members of the German rocket team that the US government captured to hasten American development of such vehicles. The V-2 slaves worked in an underground factory. The space age there and then begins in pain and darkness. The failure to fully acknowledge this history should haunt all of us who dream of space. But conventional wisdom says that the space age began on October 4th, 1957, when the Russians launched an artificial moon called Sputnik. This came as, to put it mildly, a shock to the American people, and the space race began in earnest. American rockets blew up, leading to jokes about Kaputnik. But once Explorer 1 began to orbit the Earth in 1958, which led to the discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts, the seesaw competition between these two superpowers led to one achievement in space after another, culminating in the moon landings. And so the poems that follow in this section of the book um, are a partial documentation of a time of many firsts. First man in space, the first spacewalks, first photos of the moon's far side, first flyby of Mars, first probes to crash and then to soft land on the moon. And they include fetching evocations of childhood memories of the launch of Sputnik and a heartbreaking elegy for Laika, the Soviet dog that was the first animal to orbit Earth and the first to die in orbit. William Carlos Williams celebrates the first human in space, Yuri Gagarin, while well, other poets give us the spacewalks of both the Russian and American programs. Pablo Neruda's poem, which you'll hear, gestures toward views of the space race from countries it was meant to sway. And its inclusion in this book suggests the uncharted scope of global poetic responses to the space age. One legacy of the Cold War competition and the potential for it to become hot is portrayed in Lauren Isley's poem, Sunset of Laramie, work that reflects America's obsession with the period when the Soviet Union, Soviet Union dominated the quest for space and this ongoing competition between nations. But let's hear from the poets themselves. I mentioned Laika, the dog that the Soviets launched um, in Sputnik II, and we're going to hear the poet Frank Dino read his elegy for that creature. My name is Frank Paino, and I'm going to be reading my poem, Laika. Laika was the first dog to be launched into low Earth orbit, and this occurred on the 3rd of November, 1957, on the Russian spacecraft Sputnik 2. One of the scientists who uh, worked to acclimate Laika was Dr. Yazdovsky, and this poem has an epigraph from one of his journals where he wrote, Laika was quiet and charming, I wanted to do something nice for her. She had so little time left to live. Laika. Because she'd gone unbroken by three years on Moscow's barren streets, she'd proved her will to survive simply by surviving, and so was chosen for a kind of brute salvation a halfway gift whose bad conclusion was already written in a lack of funds and time and the keen knowledge there'd be no way to bring her back. And so began fierce weeks of acclimation, each cage smaller than the last to accustom her to stricture tight as an overnight case, the relentless gyre of the centrifuge to mimic the weight of a scent and crude machines to simulate the cacophonous dirge of ignition, shrieking metal, everything it would take to lift a 13-pound mongrel into history. He called her Little Curly, Little Bug, as if naming the doomed 
taking her home one night to play with his two bright-eyed daughters could make the great burden of her approaching death a lighter thing to bend beneath when it came time to tighten the harness just once again and no more. To hold her in waiting while the riddle of malfunction was worked through its three-day resolution and she watched from within that aluminum tomb where she could stand or lie but never turn and late October's chill settled its silver pall around her. Three days and finally lift off. Then three anxious hours back on earth before they saw her heart's green tracery slow again to nearly calm while the unshed core quietly kindled its indigo fire inside the polished dome. Listen, there is no other way to tell a thing that has no mercy in it. She burned up from the inside, fevered, frantic, blood-boiled, 600 miles between herself and solid ground. And there's no faith to be placed in the weary myth of sacrifice. No way to make right the trust that was betrayed, the muzzle and mad tongue of it. How she was thrust into weightlessness, into the useless memory of the man who spoke softly, who turned at last from the wild extravagance of the round and riveted window about which he'd been so adamant, as if she might somehow savor the breathless view the spinning blue that beckoned like a ball tossed into a street she could only return to in flames. Another poem, uh, this is by Pablo Neruda, translated and read by Forrest Gander. And we have a note uh, appended to the poem in the anthology to explain it. Uh, this is a, a poem about the first time uh, two separate spacecraft, um, crude spacecraft, two human beings met in orbit the Vostok 3 and 4, in August of 1962. And this is what Pablo Neruda said about that, um, that um, rendezvous in space. He said that poetry must search for new words to talk about these things. Those two astronauts who communicate with one another, who are watched over and directed from our distant planet, who eat and sleep in the unmapped cosmos, are the poets' discoverers of the world. So here is a poem called 21 by Paulo Neruda and translated and read by Forrest Gander. From Then Come Back, the lost Neruda poems, 21. Those two solitary men, those first men up there, what of ours did they bring with them? What from us, the men of Earth? It occurs to me that the light was fresh then, that an unwinking star journeyed along, cutting short and linking distances, their faces unused to the awesome desolation in pure space, among astral bodies polished and glistening like grass at dawn. Something new came from the earth, wings or bone coldness, enormous drops of water or surprise Thoughts, a strange bird throbbing to the distant human heart. And not only that, but cities, smoke, the roar of crowds, bells and violins, the feet of children leaving school, all of that is alive in space now, from now on, because the astronauts didn't go by themselves. They brought our earth, the odors of moss and forest, love, the crisscrossed limbs of men and women, terrestrial rains across the prairies. Something floated up like a wedding dress behind the two spaceships. It was our spring on earth, blooming for the first time that conquered an inanimate heaven, depositing in those altitudes the seed of our kind. Um. For fellow uh, space nerds out there, I did misspeak. Uh, Vostok 3 and 4 were in orbit at the same time. They didn't actually rendezvous. That didn't happen until the Gemini program. So a uh, little fact correction there. I'm, I'm going to end this section uh, before we get into the Apollo and moon landing um, uh, part of the anthology uh, and with a, a poem by the Scottish poet Edward Morgan, 
uh, and it simply called for the international poetry incarnation, uh, which, uh, as he notes in the poem, was held at Royal Albert Hall on June 11, 1965. So this was just a, a, a massive poetry festival uh, that took place in London on that summer day. Uh, Ginsburg was there, a number of poets were there. So Edwin Morgan, perhaps better known um, in um, uh, the United Kingdom, but uh, a, a prolific and, and important poet. So this is um, his take on the space age in 1965 for the International Poetry Incarnation. World scene, world time, space breaker, wild ship, star man, Gemini man dangles white and golden. The world floats on a gold cord and curves blue white, beautiful below him. Bostock shrieks and prophecies. Mariners' prongs flash to the wailing of Boschkov earth size. She shakes men loose at last out in our time to be living seeds sent far beyond even imagination. Though imagination is awake, take poets on your voyages. Prometheus embraces Icarus and in a gold shell with wings, he launches him up to the ghostly detritus of gods and dirty empires and dying laws. He mounts, he cries, he shouts, he shines, he streams like light new done. His home is in a sun and he shall be the burning unburned one. In darkness, Daedalus embraces Orpheus. The dark lips caked with earth and roots, he kisses open the cold body he rubs to a new life. The dream flutters in a cage of crumbling bars, reviving and then beginning slowly singing of the stars. Beginning singing, born to go, to cut the cord of gold, to get the man newborn to go. As we'll see, um, that sort of exuberance and optimism uh, was an outlier in the poetic response to the space age, uh, and certainly uh, uh, in America, the response to Apollo uh, was not terribly optimistic or supportive. Uh, still under the sway of a romantic conception of the human mechanized sullying of nature and a modernist sense of fragmentation, irony, and technological doubt, most poets writing in English reacted to lunar exploration with notes of hesitation, if not outright disdain. They included in their stanzas references to the moon's mythological and symbolic existence for so much of human history, an existence now stained, they thought, by Apollo's technological achievement and its only partial scientific justification. The reason for the program was, of course, largely geopolitical. A clear race to win prestige at home and around the world by beating the Soviet Union to that stark gray surface, what Apollo 11 moonwalker Buzz Aldrin called magnificent desolation. The military connotations, despite the plaque on the lunar lander that said, we came in peace for all mankind, that was certainly on the minds of many poets responding to the Apollo era. But as we gain distance from that time, there seems to be a renewed appreciation for the first uh, landing of humans on the moon, for that feat, and what it tells us about our aspirations for an uncertain future. Perhaps this derives from our sense of growing fragility in what has been called the Anthropocene, the geologic age of Earth in which humans have so altered its surface and the atmosphere that the continued vibrancy of the biosphere and indeed our own species survival is at stake. With the discovery of water ice and permanently shadowed areas of the lunar poles, and with an energetic private sector determined to reach the moon and Mars, we can remember the Apollo era not only with nostalgia and ambivalence, but with a standpoint that holds them together along that line, like the terminator that divides the lunar night and day. We can walk and appreciate both paradox and promise. And what I um, would like to read here now, two poems. Um, we'll hear three in this section. I'll read two, one by Robert Hayden, one by Stanley Kunitz, and, and, and then we'll hear from Elise Bensel. So Robert Hayden, uh, you may know, if you know um, American poetry, uh, wrote Middle Passage and Those Winter Sundays, a prominent African-American poet of the mid-century. And this is his take on the astronauts of the Apollo uh, 17 moon landing. It's just called Astronauts. Armored in oxygen, 
faceless advisors, mirror masks reflecting the mineral glare and shadow of moonscape. They walk slow motion, floating the lifeless dust of Taurus Litro. Wow, they exclaim, oh boy, this is it. They sing, exulting, though trained to be wary of emotion and philosophy, breaking the calcine stillness of once absolute otherware, risking edges, earthlings to whom only their machines are friendly and God's radar watching eye. They labor at gathering proof of hypotheses in snowshine of sunlight. Dangerous as radium, probe detritus for clues. What is it we wish them to find for us as we watch them on our screens? They loom there, heroic anti-heroes, smaller than myth and poignantly human. Why are we troubled? What do we ask of these men? What do we ask of ourselves? And this is the poet Stanley Kunitz the flight of Apollo, and it's in two parts. The first part is a, is a prose poem. One, earth was my home, but even there I was a stranger. This mineral crust, I walked like a swimmer. What titanic bombardments in those old astral wars. I know what I know. I shall never escape from the strangeness or complete my journey. Think of me as nostalgic afraid, exalted. I am your man on the moon, a speck of megalomania, restless for the leap toward island universes, pulsing beyond where the constellations set. Infinite space overwhelms the human heart, but in the middle of nowhere, inexorably, life calls to life. Forward my mail to Mars, what news from the great spiral nebula of Andromeda and the Magellanic clouds? Two, I was a stranger on earth. Stepping on the moon, I begin the gay pilgrimage to new Jerusalems and foreign galaxies. Heat, cold, craters of silence, the sea of tranquility rolling on the shores of entropy and beyond the intelligence of stars. And now we will hear from the contemporary poet at least Bensel and her contribution to Beyond Earth's Edge. My name is Elise Bensel, and I am currently in my home in Brevard, North Carolina. And I will be reading my poem, Lunar, from the anthology Beyond Earth's Edge, The Poetry of Space Flight. Lunar. Moon's mother's blacked out our initials written beside an emblem of absence. Perfect 28 days apart between the glossy pages of the wall calendar. What mattered was the beginning, the forecast predictions set in oceanic pelvic wanderings. Hysterical women were thought incurable because their organs would not stay still. The uterus pooled the body in accordance with the moon's orbit. As punishment, we spent blood-drained hours with the nurse before she ushered us back to class. Our teachers shook their heads at the terror of girls who wrapped hoodies around their hips, palmed tampons as they shuffled toward the bathroom. The moon must have been moving inside us. We gritted through the pain, learned to bear it. Nothing like labor, we were told. Our bodies boxed inside the weeks, the months, the years. Now, there are no longer any moons. We are irregular from hormones or unpredictable comets falling in the ovary or menopause, endometriosis. Our pain with a shrug, a smile, a marked patience for suffering as we wonder at the first men in padded spacesuits who conquered a distant satellite feared for centuries, their spaceship's trajectory calculated by women. The men swept up in a new field that released their bodies from heaviness. The women anchored to the ground even as their hips split open to new worlds that already existed. Every day, meteorites are hurled into the planet. The sound when the men re-entered the atmosphere was impossible to predict. 
No one could breathe from their diaphragms to expel all that sharpness from their lungs. Thank you, Chris. So now I'll be reading from the section titled Robotic Explorers. It would be difficult to overstate how profoundly robotic exploration has altered our understanding of our solar system. Earth-based telescopes have offered glimpses of other planets for four centuries, but with the advent of robotic spacecraft and the missions that sent them on journeys no humans could undertake with modern technology, our knowledge of the solar system has expanded exponentially, opening human imaginations to the stranger than fiction realities of our nearest neighbors in the cosmos. Robotic spacecraft blur the boundaries of what exploration means. The poems about robotic spacecraft that you'll hear tonight wrestle with the boundary between human and machine, vehicle and explorer, and how the new knowledge these robotic explorers send back changes the humans who receive it, both their understanding of the universe and of themselves. Human concepts of connection, beauty, and meaning become fluid in the context of robotic missions. Poet Donna Kane imagines Pioneer 10 leaving behind human ideas of loneliness to become simply alone as it travels beyond the asteroid belt, a tangible expression of human thought reaching out in search of an object. And so we'll hear Donna's poem read by her, and this is video number four. Hello, my name is Donna Kane, and I am reading from Rolla, British Columbia, Canada. The poem in the anthology that's mine is called Pioneer 10, and it was inspired by a space probe of the same name launched by NASA in 1972. Its shadow has been gone since liftoff, but it took light disappearing before lonely seemed simply alone. Or if not alone, then deep in the lab of the not understood, the not taste of ourselves in its gold dust, the not soot plumped sweat of our brows incandescent with plutonium. Shed of silver, quick, small, Ideas burning off like surplus fuel. The Pioneer 10 is a thought clicked shut. Limbs drawn in, it drops like a tick from the brain's limbic core, like a photon, traveling who knows for how long before reaching a body, the way the mind needs an object, something to crack open on, and by its reflection, shine. So few missions have held humans as wrapped as that of the Voyager spacecraft. Launched in 1977, twin spacecraft Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 sent back transformative data about the outer planets and their moons, which were continuing on the trajectory out of the solar system. The poet Jessica Ray Bergamino lets Voyager 1 speak to us directly, describing the experience of turning to take the iconic family portrait of the solar system a mosaic image of Earth, Venus, and the outer planets taken more than 4 billion miles from Earth on Valentine's Day, 1990. For Bergamino, the image displays Earth's longing mirrored back to itself. The spacecraft sent to explore boundless distances will ultimately turn toward Earth like a disillusioned lover. This is after taking the family portrait of the solar system, Voyager 1 understands herself as Orpheus in Plain Daylight by Jessica Ray Bergerino. Past Pluto, I turned to watch the pale thrill of Earth spinning on about me. We both knew I could never return. She was already warm and cold, beginning, even then, to melt. But what's true about leaving is true about looking back. Both require doubt or poignancy. And if I'm honest, we all know I turned because she called. I'd always been a mirror for her will. So this is how I measure distance, not in the leaving, but in the being left, in the absence of touch, the billions, in small orbits strung upon small orbits, spinning to some celestine harmony we were never meant to count. 
I sent all I could across the distance, thrills of zeros and ones, dimming to data on an astronomer's desk. How she saw herself then, fragrant, green, lit by the smear of sun, a bright crescent hung beside Venus flame, both of them popped by longing. She thought she was center of the universe once, and how close she was, straddled by fortune while Neptune and Uranus clung to the dark edges of sight. So yes, I turned, because who doesn't deserve to see ourselves in the ghost of what loves us? And she sang in code to celebrate, programming my eyes to close and never open, making sure my last long gaze was her blue reflection, her blue face becoming its own reflection. How silly I was to call this a love letter. Somewhere, Mercury is retrograde. Dan Beachy Quick and Shree Kemp Ready consider photographs of Mars sent back by Opportunity, the plucky rover active from 2004 to 2008. They think about an image that the machine sends back, which prompts a human on Earth to say it's beautiful, and consider the question of who's doing the looking in robotic missions. Is it the machine or is it the human? And so we'll hear this read by Dan Beachy Quick, and this is video five. Hi, my name is Dan Beachy Quick, and uh, I'm reading a poem that was written in collaboration with my friend, the wonderful poet Srikanth Reddy. Uh, and I'm reading from the spaceship that's my living room. The lander turns its lens to photograph its track, stretching across the red dust back to horizon, conducts a test to see what this world lacks, corrects its own path, witness the confusion in the red dirt where the boulder's shadow leans across the path, an aesthetic sensation the machine captured by accident whose glow on the computer screen excites a human nerve to say it's beautiful. A world absent sorrow. One must have a mind of winter to observe. No, scratch that. One must have a mind of winter to regard. The infinitesimal curve of horizon, extended off screen, will round itself into unending. Figure 11, the word beyond stamped on a speckled egg I found in art news last winter, the remains of a bird unborn forever within. Shake it and it rattles, a child's toy. Oology, we admit, is an absurd hobby, nonetheless popular. A, a crossword riddle answer in the Sunday Times from a century in which we no longer live. When the cattle bird's egg displayed on the mantle, penury now but then a wealth as through a telescope quaint hobby, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and watery Saturn are each an egg in orbit's nest. Tired tropes, I tire of them and you tire of them, whoever you are. My mind is a nothing that is hanging from a rope. Robotic spacecraft encapsulate the human desire to see, to know, and to understand. They carry human vision far across the solar system and even deep into the time of its formation. The final poem I'll read from this section is my own, which was written for this book. You'll hear a reference in this poem to a mission out of the University of Arizona happening right now, which is OSIRIS-REx. And OSIRIS-REx right now is at asteroid Bennu and is attempting, will attempt later this month to bring home a sa sample, to take the sample and bring it home. So we're wishing them all the best on that mission. And this is Psalm 8. If you let it, the moon will tell you your smallness. Fragile creature on a tilted planet, Facing the open darkness, while the sun burns on beyond your sight. We have so long now denied that we think we are the center. The Copernican sun firmly anchored in the sky we swim through. But I write to you as one who knows her own heart. So I say to you, blessed is the wild distance of the night. The gauzy light of nebulas reaching us long after they're gone. Blessed are the asteroids, those fragments of the beginning, which we did not create. 
Blessed the spacecraft that goes to bring a peace back to us. The origin of oceans may be written in its dust. Blessed, too, those machines that go without thought of return. The glimpses they send back of worlds we thought we knew. The opalescent worlds of storms churning on Jupiter. Liquid pooled deep beneath the south pole of Mars. Faintest sunlight kindling Pluto's peaks of ice bright as sacred flame. Blessed, all the universe beyond us, and we who hunger and thirst to know it, shadowed on the earth, calculating the trajectories of light. So with that, I'll turn to the section entitled Humans in Low Earth Orbit. In the post-Apollo void, the space shuttle was presented as a reliable, cost-effective approach that can meet scientific, military, and commercial needs, flying more than 40 missions a year. But with these challenging goals, the shuttle, as it finally launched in 1981, was a very different vehicle from what anyone had hoped for. Across 30 years of operation and 135 missions and five completed orbiters, it would never live up to what had been promised of it. Yet for the American public, the shuttle is one of the most recognizable images of the space program. The space shuttle era was ultimately one of impressive technical and scientific achievement. Low Earth orbit, the limit of the shuttle orbiter's range, may not have been a new frontier, but the public often experienced it as if it were. The length of the shuttle program's existence and the diversity of the crews who flew on the five orbiters made it a program that felt familiar, part of the fabric of public life that the poems in this section inhabit. In the poem, Zero Gravity by Welsh poet Gwyneth Lewis, you'll hear an account of the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery in 1997 on a mission which serviced the Hubble Space Telescope. The crew included Lewis's cousin, the astronaut Joe Tanner, and he's addressed throughout the poem, which captures the fear and excitement of watching the launch. So this is a long poem titled Zero Gravity, but I'll just read one section. And this is again by Gwyneth Lewis. Thousands arrive when a bird's about to fly, crowding the causeways. Houston, weather is go and counting. I pray for you as you lie on your back, facing upwards. A placard shows local, shuttle, and universal time. Numbers run out. Zero always comes. Main engines are gimbaled, and I'm not ready for this. But clouds of steam billow out sideways, and a sudden spark lifts the rocket on a collective roar. It comes from inside us. With a sonic crack, the spaceship explodes to a flower of fire on the scaffold stable. We sob and swear helpless but we're lifting a sun with our love's attention. We hear the shuttle's death rattle as it overcomes its own weight with glory, setting car alarms off in the keys. And then it's gone, out of this time zone, into the calm of black. We've lost the lemon dawn, your vanishing maid. At the viewing site, we pick oranges for your missing light. Although the space shuttle orbiters never left low Earth orbit, they facilitated views into the vast distances of space via telescopes operated beyond Earth's atmosphere, most famously the Hubble Space Telescope. Tracy K. Smith, who was U.S. Poet Laureate from 2017 to 2019, records memories of her father, an engineer who worked on Hubble before its launch in her poem, My God, It's Full of Stars. As the poem closes, Smith writes, we saw to the edge of all there is, but that new sight brings no comfort or finality. Instead, the extreme distance of space and time glimpsed by Hubble is, quote, so brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. So this is a section from Tracy K. Smith's poem, My God, It's Full of Stars. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold and bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. 
These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di. Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jived. We saw to the edge of all there is, so brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. Looking at what we see is an important theme in all of these poems. And to think about what we see when we look at Earth from space, we'll now hear from Alison Hopper Denning. So this should be video six. Hi, this is Alison Deming, and I'm going to read to you from my home in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, this poem, Homeland Security, which is in the anthology, was inspired by Scott Kelly when he spent his year in space. And one of the ways that he kept himself sane and balanced up there, speeding around the earth, was by taking photos. And his Twitter feed was an absolute marvel. And I was astonished and fell in love with all of his photos and uh, wanted to write something in admiration of him and, and his brother, Mark, because they're twins, they were able to provide really interesting data about what happens to the body when it spends a year in space. The poem was originally written for an anthology edited by Taylor Brorby um, about fracking, uh, entitled Fracture. And so um, it was an opportunity to bring together my uh, concern for the fate of Earth in the era of climate change with the astonishing insights that come from our space travel. And although some people will say, well, we should take care of Earth and not try to go to space, uh, this poem, I hope, helps to bring us closer to thinking about how going to space may help us uh, think about care of the Earth. So this is Homeland Security. What is a day to the astronaut floating 200 miles above Earth, the space station whirling 15 and a half times a day around the planet while he drifts weightless as if unmoving, sipping meals from a plastic pouch. Is that how it works, keeping everything contained against the drift? His twin is down here, donating biometrics to the database. What is a year to them, their bones and hearts and brains? That's what the instruments want to know and what we've taught them to want. The space twin will pay the higher price for his unearthly habitation. Bodies need gravity or some system that simulates the magnetic pull of mantle and core. He can see home from a porthole in space, the planet from out here, Sublime, a blue and white ball, so tender it might be made of glass, just forming at the tip of the glass blower's rod. The Earth twin wa watches his brother lift from the cosmodrome, zero to 17,000 in 12 minutes. It feels like the hand of God has come down and grabbed you by the collar and ripped you off the planet. You know you're either going to float in space or you're going to be dead. What is Earth to the astronaut? The exception to emptiness. Boatloads of planets lie further in the black concealment of space. Best that we don't know their voraciousness and need. Our home, we know, is troubled, yet still in the heyday of its experiment with life. Thanks, cyanobacteria, for your evolutionary largesse, the great oxygenation event that made us possible. I'm writing this to find my way into the fray over fracking, 
wild card as it seems now that I've gone so far out into space. No one wants to hear again about flaming water faucets, exploited towns and farms, heartland riddled with quakes, water poisoned and stuck back in the ground to find its way home. Space might be the only way to see what kind of sky we need and how the great carbonation event might be flipping the way Earth does or doesn't do life. We say blue marble, we say Mother Earth, we say home. The astronaut says beautiful. Earth from space says keep me. The only thing that matters is the carbon. So homeland security means leave it in the ground, lock it up with soldiers standing guard. Shelter it with grassland and trees. That's a good poem to transition into our last section um, tonight. This is the last part of the anthology. And the title is uh, To the Stars with Difficulties. And um, for many readers, uh, there's poetry and there's science fiction. Separate genres doing different things. But science fiction poetry is a subgenre within the larger sci-fi community. And this selection of poetry takes us from yesterday's tomorrows of say the Star Trek universe to contemporary visions of a future Mars in which humans are engineering its planet to sustain terrestrial life, then onward to indigenous imaginings of a wider cosmos as, a both, as both a technological and spiritual home. And this is only a small sampling in this section of mainstream poets, uh, science fiction authors that are known for their prose, and science fiction poets themselves who publish in journals specializing in that um, field. And so I want to read um, a poem by Kim Stanley Robinson. Some of you may know his novels. Uh, he has an, uh, another one out this year called The Ministry of the Future. And this is um, a poem that he uh, calls Canyon Color. And if you know his fiction, um, he often has poems that he's written embedded in his prose. So this is set on a future Mars. Canyon color. In Lazuli Canyon, boating, sheet ice overshadowed stream, cracking under our bow. Stream grows wide, curves into sunlight, a deep bend in the ancient channel, plumes of frost at every breath. Endless rise of the Red Canyon, canyon in canyons, no end to them. Black lines web rust sandstone. Wind carved a boulder over us there on a wet red beach, green moss, green sedge, green. Not nature, not culture, just Mars. Western sky, deep violet, two evening stars, one white, one blue, Venus and the Earth. And we're going to hear now uh, from three poets uh, in sequence. Uh, the poet Kyle Darden. So this is um, seven, eight, and nine. Our last uh, taped uh, contributions of uh, our um, some of our poets tonight. So Kyle Darden will um, share a poem with us, and then Tohahum Justin Biga, and then C. S. E. Cooney. And then I'll say a few words and share a little bit from a poem by Nikki Giovanni, and then we'll take questions. Hello, this is Kyle Dargan, recording for Beyond Earth's Edge, uh, recording live from somewhere, uh, no, Washington, D.C. And um, I don't know, I, I think about the fact that the sun is going to expand or explode often um, just as a reminder to not take uh, what happens on Earth too seriously because it's just the fact that, you know, one day um, the solar shock wave is going to undo uh, this planet, which is not an undoing of humanity, um, but it is sort of an undoing of this particular uh, terrestrial understanding of ourselves and our, our history. Um, and the fact is, you know, the hope in that, the only hope in that is, is space flight. 
right? We are going to have to be somewhere else at some point. Um, in some ways, you know, Earth is kind of like a a womb for us, and to a degree, we don't understand space that much more than you know a baby understands amniotic fluid. Um, but we must pass through it um, in some way, and maybe there's just something instinctual about our seeking the stars and our seeking somewhere else to be. Um, I hope that is the case at least. So. This poem opens with an epigraph from the now deceased Mac Miller, um, which is, I know the planet Earth is about to explode. Kind of hope that no one saves it. We only grow from anguish. Dear Echo, in the likely event of galactic calamity, our sun's hydrogen reserves fuse through the star turned red giant bloating as do our corpses. You will require flames between the solar shock wave and Earth's rattling an opaque interval. You must watch, but we people prior will have left no crude fluid for ignition, for light, having tapped this rock to gorge our bellies to petroleum ache. Perhaps you will have evolved blood supplemented with Edison and Tesla's currents, half your body fed by generators that slow cure your biomass or waste. Maybe you will be self-luminous. But if you are still like we, like me, a mere meat pod fated to watch Mercury and Venus engulfed, surely you hold designs for an interplanetary arc. Anticipate humanity's years spent adrift in the dark liquor of space lost within hibernation and missing mother planet, further exchange from all revelation of how we came to be. From this unproven vantage point, inside our history with no solid alpha, I claim to pity you and your inherited tasks to catalog the last telluric pulse, close the case of man as now known. But beneath my softened hide, I am envious. All of our missteps as shepherds, all of the graffiti eclipsing our souls, all of it will cinder, and you will view this erasure from your Mars-bound barge. You will know the phenomenon that is judgment. See it real time as prophets allegedly witnessed. Sapiens will never have beheld a clearer beacon to be reborn. Star Lodge. Astral Project, Indigenous Futurism, Cyberpunk Spacecraft, Moonrock Ambush, Firing Laser Projectiles from Electro Bow, Robots Programmed with a Connection to Creation, Transmitting Radio Signals on reciprocation. This is not a second chance, but an extension cord, umbilical, unbiblical. Indigenous resurgence across solar systems, traditional hunting grounds across Mercury, living off of interplanetary land, space seal hunting on Pluto, elders watching Ceres, Chiron, Lilith, curving around the sun in ovoids, recording interstellar winter solstice to spring equinox and summer to aroma of crushed leaves musty, sage and sweet grass burning as the gas of Venus. Put down tobacco in orbit around Saturn before pulling debris away to build our wigwams. Obviously, space Dene live between Uranus and Neptune, the planetary north, and Cree sun dances on Mercury, a new kind of sacrifice one hell of a tan. God be damned. We ain't alone out here after all. Just us long-standing hybrids, intergalactic chimeras, mixed matched and star silk stacked, weaved and stitched, DMB powwow drum, echoes across galaxies, beating the heart of these ancient imaginations. Our bodies reflect the land, so bring me to Jupiter, 
to see how noxious an eternal storm shape evolution. Heard buffalo across dusty orange plains, Mars, Raven and Coyote emerge out of Saturn to rearrange the lovers, orbiting Jupiter, replacing those star stories with something fitting our expanding breath. I can see it now. Whether the sky is blue in daytime or starshine, I continue to dream with Venus powered heart and imagination energized by Neptune out here traveling. This is C.S.E. Cooney recording Dog Star Men in Queens, New York. All the men I might have loved have gone to Sirius. Sirius, the dog star, the dread star of summer, that cranberry bog, that red lamp district, promising scarlet women, scarlet waves of grain, a wine-stained sea. My lovely men are gone, leaving their braids behind them. They have left their braids, but have taken the veins of their wrists, their bony faces and transparent fingers, their cigarettes. Even the moist taunt of their throats they have stolen away, forsaking everything to be happy on Sirius. Oh, Sirius, your houses are made of bougainvillea leaves. Your rain is pink and balsamic. There is blood soup to eat, and dragons, and every one is a surgeon. Like Magellan before them, my men have circumnavigated mystery without me. And we'll give Nikki Giovanni the last, um, the last word from our poets. She has a long poem here at the end <clears throat> called Quilting the Black Eyed Pea. And the subtitle is We're Going to Mars. I'm just going to read a very short portion of this, as I think um, it addresses some of the issues that have been implicit in the readings tonight and certainly the moment that we're in as a, as a culture and species. So this is Nikki Giovanni. We're going to Mars because whatever is wrong with us will not get right with us. So we journey forth, carrying the same baggage, but every now and then leaving one little bitty thing behind. Maybe drop torturing hunchbacks here. Maybe drop lynching Billy Bud there. Maybe not whipping Uncle Tom to death. Maybe resisting global war. One day looking for prejudice to slip. One day looking for hatred to tumble by the wayside. And with that, we're happy to take uh, any questions from the audience? I think Shiloh will, will pass those on to us. Yep. And so thank you all very much for listening. All right, your first question. I was hoping Julie and Chris could speak to the roles of the mystery they see in spaceflight poetry. That's a great question. Do we need to, and do we need to repeat the question, Shiloh? I can do. Um, the asker asks, I was hoping Julie and Chris could speak to the role they see mystery playing in spaceflight and poetry. Yeah, so thinking about mystery, um, two of my favorite poems in the book, you heard one of them, um, Tracy K. Smith's My God, It's Full of Stars. And a poem that's right after that in the book is by Adrian the Rich, it's called Hubble Photographs After Southland. Both of those um, poems think about looking across huge distances. And of course, as we think about Looking out into space, there's a ton of mystery. There's so much we don't know. And there's, we just get these little pieces along the way that are huge revelations. But in both of those poems, you get the sense that in looking out into space, we don't necessarily know what we're gonna find. Tracy K. Smith finds that to be, in a sense, overwhelming. Um, but there's also real power to the mystery of space that she sees, I think. It's alive, it comprehends us as much as we comprehend it. Um, with Adrian Rich's poem, she compares looking to space, she kind of puts it against the gaze of a lover, and that in the beloved's gaze, you have this person who does look back to you, um, who is somebody that you can interact with, and there's this degree of closeness, um, which brings danger with it. And so for Adrian Rich, and thinking about the hugeness of space, the distance, the mystery, there's this kind of sense of relief. 
um, but there's so much of it and she can't hurt it by her own game. So those are two things that come to mind in thinking about mystery, but certainly there's a sense in many of these poems um, that in mystery there's possibility. Yeah, that's lovely. I, I, I agree um, with everything Julia said, and I was just thinking as she was talking about um, some of the poems that you didn't hear from the um, lunar landing section, from the Apollo section, uh, poems by Mae Swenson um, and Anne Sexton in particular come to mind, in which they're talking about kind of the cultural mystery of the moon, the symbolic import of um, that object in the sky, and how for them, landing on the moon was a kind of um, disenchantment and, and sort of a demystifying of, of, that, of that symbol. And yet, um, as Julie has just said, the, um, the mysteries of science um, continue. And uh, for me, at least when, you know, it was a surprise to me to see how sort of um, skeptical the poets uh, were in the 1960s. And I guess it shouldn't have been that surprising to me um, about the Apollo moon landings. Um, and, I, and I think that that sense of, of mystery being robbed um, has been more than repaid by the fact that, you know, as Julie said, the, the cosmos is really big and there are scientific mysteries, you know, yet to be um, discerned and understood on the moon itself. So for me, the, the, the poets who have responded to um, spaceflight as a sort of disenchantment um, maybe got it wrong, even though, you know, their poets are really admired, like Anne Sexton and, and Mae Swenson. All right. Your next question. Um, what was the process of putting the book together? Yeah, so I mentioned um, it had started from an exhibit that I had together for the Poetry Center. So we had kind of a pour of poems that I had gotten from that. Um, so at the point that Chris and I started working on it together, um, we started just searching, kind of going through everything we could find. We did a lot of searching in the library catalog. I was a uh, librarian, and so um, that's just part of the way that I think. We found a lot of poems that way. Um, Chris brings a lot of knowledge about science fiction writing, um, and so that kind of tapped us into some of those more classic writers in that field. Um, Chris also, I think, at one point reached out to a science fiction um, poetry listserv, and we, a number of poets, or a few poets at least, that are in the book came from that direction. So it was kind of reaching out in all different directions, um, seeking input from people, just trying to put together the most cohesive picture that we could of um, kind of covering across the history of space play. Yeah, and we also, um, we got in touch with two astronauts. So that was part of the process too, uh, which, was, which was great fun. So two, um, two astronauts in the anthology, um, no, no poets, or rather uh, no astronauts that we know of, had creative writing classes before going to orbit, but Al Warden came back from his mission on Apollo 15 and wrote um, a book of poetry called Hello Earth. And then uh, the shuttle astronaut, Story Musgrave, um, who was part of the Hubble Space Telescope Repair Mission that um, Tracy K. Smith was writing about, that Julie read from, um, also came back and, and wrote poetry. And so we have two poems from, from two astronauts in the book. All right, your next question. Alison Deming talked about how space may be able to create perspectives of the problems on Earth. How has working with this anthology changed your perspectives about societal issues? That's a big question. Um, I mean, one thing that comes to mind um, that happened really recently, so this was kind of at the point that we were waiting for the book to come out, um, was the Crew Dragon launch, which happened really not long after um, the killing of George Floyd. And there was this sense in that moment that there was this exciting thing happening with space, but then there was incredible um, and really right unrest happening across the country. And so in that moment, um, I think some people try to kind of paint it as like, everyone's looking to space, it's this great unifier. Um, but in thinking about that, even though lots of people can come to space, and we really hope this book represents the wide array of people that might be interested in space, which is everybody, um, and kind of the unique perspectives that they might bring to it. Um, space also doesn't get rid of the problems that we have here on Earth. We take them with us, or they, they impact us in, into that future time and into those things that we do. Um, so in thinking about, um, thinking about what I've learned through writing this book, it's that really, no matter what we're doing, whether it's here on Earth, whether it's going into space, we have to be really intentional about 
approaching issues like racial injustice, we have to be really intentional about how we talk about it and how we actually act and um, kind of make opportunities for people and make opportunities for people to speak directly. Yeah, I, I would echo all of that. I think um, I, I keep coming back to um, the Nikki Giovanni poem, and I hope that that little snippet gave you a sense. I, I share um, her perspective um, that the, as Julie says, the uh, intentionality that we need to bring to all the problem solving, and there are many problems uh, that we're facing on this on this planet. Um, but that also doesn't. It's not a. It's not an either or, you know. And, and and for me, I've long felt like the the sort of sense that we're you know either we solve everything on Earth or we go to space. This always has seemed to me to be a false choice. Um, I think we have the bandwidth, we have the intelligence, and we have the wisdom as a species to 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 do more more than one thing at a time. So we need to tackle um, so much, so many wicked problems, climate change. Um, uh, the rise of fascism, the, the fear of science that's being stoked by certain forces. Um, and, it, and, and I think we can explore space. I think we can do all of those things. And I think that the, um, the, the need for wonder, um, the need for curiosity, the need for the sublime is embedded in us. And that space exploration brings that out. Uh, and, and so I see it as not a waste of resources, but an extension of the best parts of ourselves. And, and that helps us wherever we are. Thank you. All right, your next question. Throughout the journey of creating this book, what was the most inspirational moment you had on a personal level while thinking of the potential of humankind and the responsibility each of us carry for the future? Wow, okay, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, Julie, what are you talking yeah. Um, well, that's a great question. I mean, coming to this book, I've had a lifelong interest in space. Um, but working on this book, I really, I read a lot. I've listened to a ton of things and I've really thought in a more systematic way about this topic. Um, and so there's so many parts to that question. I'm trying to think through each of them. Kind of a personal moment of inspiration. I mean, I think some of the things we've been talking about are really some of the key issues for me, like thinking about um, Allison's poem and the way that space gives us perspective to see how fragile Earth is, how much um, we really need to be conscious about what we're doing here on Earth and making sure that we have a future and that um, the, the children living now and their children will have a future as well. Um, so that's, that's something that comes to mind a lot. It's just the way that space gives us perspective. Um, I guess an inspiring moment for me personally was writing the poem that I read. Um, as far as I know, that's the only poem that was written just for the book itself. I didn't have um, a totally space-focused poem. Um, and so it was beginning of 2019. It was the point that it was like, I have to write something. Um, if it's going to be in the book, we need to get this done. Um, and when I sat down to write that poem, it was one of those ones that I just kind of wrote in one go, because I think all of those thoughts had been in my mind through the course of working on this book. Um, and I hope what that poem is saying is that we really need or I think we really need a sense of the hugeness of the universe and a hugeness, our smallness rather than diminishing us um, should tell us how much we need to care for one another and really care for where we are. Um, so that's hopefully an answer to that question, which was really great, so thank you. Yeah, um, that is a great question. Um, I, just two things very quickly. One would be, um, it wasn't so much a moment of inspiration, but um, it was kind of a revelation that I found inspiring as, as we were pulling together especially the poems in the last section is sort of Julie and I would call the science fiction section um, and, and having, as you heard, you know, um, at the end here, a couple of, of the, um, the voices uh, from that part of the book, the, the sort of um, uh, in, indigenous reckoning with the possible future of um, our species in space in a way that is aspirational. And I find that really inspiring. Uh, and then the other thing I would mention is uh, we've talked about the two astronauts um, getting actually getting to meet uh, Al Warden uh, here in Tucson at a, a Space Fest, which is a sort of gathering of, of space nerds. Um, and astronauts will come and they'll talk and, and so forth. And I knew that he had uh, Julian. I knew that he had written this this book. And so you know, I just asked him for you know permission to use one of his poems, and it, it just struck me um, as kind of amazing. Here is this former uh, you know, military test pilots 
uh, who goes to the moon on Apollo 15. Uh, and so he is orbiting uh, by himself while, while the two moonwalkers are below. And every time he would come around the backside of the moon to uh, reestablish contact with mission control in Houston, he would say, hello, Earth, in a different language. And I thought that gesture um, spoke to, to, to something sort of uh, deeper than the, the, the sort of geopolitical sense of what those missions were about. And so I found just talking with him and his sort of sense of, of wonder still that he had about the moon and about science uh, and, and the need for a sort of human community to, to embrace those things, I found that really pretty inspirational. All right, thank you. Okay, your next question. What do you think science can learn from poetry and vice versa? Um, what can science learn from poetry um, and vice versa? I'll do the vice versa first. Um, I think that I, I you know, it, I mean, it may have tipped my hand a little bit, um, talking a little bit about, say, May Swanson, and I love May Swanson's work. Um, and Anne Sexton and other poets, Campbell McGrath, W. H. Auden, uh, a number of the poets in the book in the Apollo section who responded so um, ang angrily, actually, and skeptically to um, the Apollo missions. Um, and, and then, you know, other poets in this book who are embracing curiosity and exploration and, and science. Um, and so uh, the, the, the confluence between uh, the poetic imagination and, and the scientific method, I think, uh, and maybe this sort of goes to both sides of the question, but that confluence between the scientific method, which is, you know, repeating results, verifying them, or falsifying them, you know, finding them not to be correct, um, that very assiduous approach to physical reality um, also has in its space, um, no pun intended, um, wonder and curiosity. And, uh, and so that, that sort of drive to understand the, the actual world, the material world around us, um, I think drives both, both realms. And I'm just, you know, I love poetry that embraces that. And um, I, I think that, that scientists who understand the kind of creative spark that poets have, that sort of associational leaping from one possibility, one possibility to another, those are those are scientists who, who do some pretty amazing things. Yeah, well said. Um, that covered a lot of ground. But the thing that comes to mind for me thinking about the strengths of poetry, um, I think of poetry as being really good at handling nuance or being comfortable with ambiguity, like being able to hold two things next to each other that don't necessarily go together and to, to make something out of that. Um, and so I think um, science certainly kind of looks into the um, kind of looks forward with the questioning stance. Um, but I think just in general, from any perspective, one of the things that poetry really brings to the table and is something to learn from is that sense of holding things together and kind of seeing what happens. Um, thinking about, you know, I talked about that in this book, I've done a lot of research just to kind of bring all my thinking together. Um, and one of the things that I appreciate about scientific missions is just how long um, they can last, how long it can take for something to be planned, for it to actually come together, and then to become this thing that goes on, I mean, for decades in the case of the Voyager probes. So thinking about um, the aspect of collaboration, the kind of long-term vision, those are things that come to mind that poets certainly do, but that are always things that we can be learning um, to do even more. All right, thank you. Your next question. Do you think that space activity brings the world of nations together? Yes and no. Um, I think uh, so. Yeah, initially, no, absolutely not. I mean, you know, the, the, the space the space age began uh, in a geopolitical context. Uh, in as the, the the little historical essay that I read from the you know the beginning, uh, you know, it shows us that the, the, the if if we trace the origin of space exploration you know, physically going there um, back to its most proximate cause, it was the Second World War. And, uh, and then the, the context shifts to the Cold War. And, and so it's really because of the fall, I think, of the Soviet Union 
um, in the Eastern Bloc and the recognition, and this actually happens with um, I think President Clinton, Reagan approves the International Space Station, or excuse me, Reagan approves a space station called Freedom. And then when Clinton is president, he invites the Russian government into, um, into cooperation. And the International Space Station has now been occupied uh, constantly for 20 years. We've had human beings off this planet for two decades. And we have astronauts coming from all over the world. And so I think that that shift to international cooperation and a sort of sense of, of um, you know, in, in international fraternity, as it were, I don't mean that in a gendered way, but you know, international kinship, um, stems maybe quite directly from the International Space Station. Now, the, the complication might be the push by private enterprise uh, by SpaceX, Blue Origin, and these other companies. And I think a lot of us are excited to, to see how that technology is unfolding, the reusability of rockets, which could lower the cost of access to space. At the same time, it is increasing, you know, increasingly a question of, of um, what happens when we get to places like the moon. Who owns the moon? There's, there's treaties that cover this. Um, but they date from the 1960s, and they did not envision private companies being able to go to these places. And so, you know, uh, again, Nikki Giovanni's uh, sense of, you know, like, we're taking, we're, we're going, and we're going to take our baggage with us, but we need to drop some of, our, of that baggage along the way. So I hope that that would be the case. Yeah, that was a great answer. <laughs> so not much to add there. I mean, one thing to say, just in the book, there are, um, it's mainly American poets, but you do find um, a, a, amount, a lot of interest from Canadian poets um, and also British poets. Um, but again, that's kind of all these related countries with a shared background, shared language, shared culture. Um, Pablo Neruda is kind of one outlier in the book, and we included him intentionally as being this kind of gesture toward um, the Soviet-looking world. But there's certainly a sense that uh, space, you know, can hopefully have like a much more cooperative future. Um, and, and I think people are probably writing around the world, but for now, what we have to offer is kind of focusing first here um, on the history. To uh, kind of go with that, your next question. Does poetry from different countries and cultures, maybe languages, reflect a different relationship with space than say America? So yeah, um, space, and I'm trying. I'm assuming the person means space as in outer space, um, but maybe it could also be space on the page. I don't know enough about kind of international poetry to talk about that, but I certainly think that uh, when you're reading poetry from around the world, that you get a different sense of how people interact with and view the world coming through with the way um, they choose to think about things and to kind of lay things out on the page. Yeah, I would just I would just add to that. Um to kind of also come back a little bit to the process of putting this together. This was about three years worth of work and it took a while, you know? Um, and so, yeah, well, I think we're both very frank about the, the standpoint of the book um, and that it, there is a gesture here toward the need to have um, certainly an anthology of um, poets from Russia responding to the space age and then an international you know, anthology and internationalizing sort of understanding the global poetic response. So it's really fertile terrain. And, and I would suggest anyone listening, they, they should tackle that next because we need that. All right, we've got time for two more. So your next question, does space activity resonate with our feelings of freedom? Does space activity resonate with our feelings of freedom? Um, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, that, the, um, I'll just have to riff a little bit um, since the question is not in the room. I would like to like to converse a little bit more about those those terms. Um, I, 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 if you define if you define freedom as again an aspirational sense of curiosity, absolutely, I think so. Um, and and at the same time, I would say that. Um, if you are defining freedom as a kind of escapism, certainly that's a thread that runs through um, the space community, the space exploration community, and people who write and think about this. But I think that's changing. And the sort of sense of grounding ourselves um, 
in our bodies, um, in the problems that we have here and how we handle them here and elsewhere, I think that's really sort of blossoming. And, and people are beginning to understand that the sort of um, childhood escapism sense of, you know, like I grew up watching Star Trek or something, you know, like that was escapist freedom for me, that that might have a place, um, and I think it does, but it's not enough uh, for us to just carry that forward because the, the difficulties that we have as, as a species are, are too big for that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. To kind of take that question in a different direction, also something that comes to mind, uh, the essayist Margaret Lazenstein has a book uh, called Leaving Orbit, which is about the end of the, the space shuttle program. And in a section of that book, she talks about watching a launch um, and the fact that she comes to the launch with this with a certain set of viewpoints. She's thinking about it as uh, a grand act of public performance art is what she says. But she describes a man next to her who um, really loves watching the launch kind of as an extension of um, his career in the military, his kind of sense of American freedom. Um, and what she says in the book is that really neither of them are wrong. All of those things are kind of tied up in space, um, which I think you've heard us talk about tonight. That there's both this um, fraught military history and there's also the sense of exploration and wonder um, and seeking new ideas. So kind of all of those things potentially come together in space flight. And rather than necessarily needing to resolve all of them, it's more interesting to me to kind of follow the threads um, and see the different things that people are bringing to the table. Right. All right, your final question. Do you see space flight and poetry as having the potential to renew our appreciation for beauty? I certainly hope so. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, definitely in this book, you know, there are many poems that touch on beauty. There are also poems that are pretty hard um, and that look at space in a pretty critical light and have some harsh things to say about it. Um, so there's, again, there's both, there's both things present um, in what's happening here. But I do think, and I do truly hope that both, um, when we look to space, we have an opportunity to see beautiful things. Uh, that was certainly something that spoke to me as a, a kid. I looked at a lot of pictures on the internet um, of objects out in space that were um, just beautiful and filled me with amazement. Um, and also with poetry, I think there's so much beauty or there's so much um, that poetry can do to kind of center us in appreciating the world um, and appreciating our lives and the lives of other people. And so I certainly hope that in this book that both of those things are happening. Yeah, I would echo that. And that's a great question. I, you know, um, I think beauty is both easy and, and difficult, um, and that um, the exploration of space and the, the exploration of language um, has this sort of sliding scale, uh, in a sense. And so if you come to this anthology, um, you'll, you'll find poems that are really accessible. Um, you'll find poems that are hard, uh, that, are, that are just aesthetically difficult. Um, and I think the same might be true of, of how we look at space. Um, it's easy and important. Uh, I don't mean easy in a, to, to denigrate that, um, but you know, the, 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 the pictures on the internet, the looking through the telescope, I mean, that, that sense of, of um, uh, excitement and wonder and the sublime is, a, is always available to us. But it gets bound up uh, with cultural questions, with questions of who we are as, as a species. Um, how we deal with the peril and the promise of anything that we might do. And so the, the, the beauty becomes a little harder, it becomes a little more complicated, a little more difficult. But I think maybe foundationally, whether it's enjoying the play of words, and you've heard some wonderful poetry tonight with poets with great ears and wonderful sense of rhythm, um, or you know, sort of looking at a, a launch of a rocket or looking through a telescope, having that immediate uh, sense of uh, connection to something bigger than yourself um, is maybe the foundation of all of that, at least for me. All right. Do you guys have any closing words before I pass it back to Mari? Just want to say thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, I, I'm sure you kind of gathered from our reading that we just wish we could read the whole book to you or have every single poet in the book read. Um, but it's really a pleasure to share this with you. And thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. I would, I would say the same thing um, and just hope that um, we will all be witnessing someday uh, the actual flight of the poet in space. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you both so much. What a wonderful night. What thank you thank to you the so who sent their uh, uh, videos. Uh, wonderful, wonderful night. We wanted just to let you all know, everyone who registered, we're going to be doing a random uh, pick to send uh, two books uh, as a giveaway to uh, to a lucky winner. Uh, we'll uh, be doing that next week. And we also wanted to uh, remind you too that if you want to purchase a book, please visit our website. It's Uve Press. Uh, .arizona.edu. Always have to pause to think of that. But again, thanks for spending um, your evening with us. Thanks to Chris and Julie for putting on an amazing program tonight. And again, a big, big thanks to Flandrau, Shiloh. Thank you for helping us uh, come together to celebrate this wonderful book. We appreciate it. You're welcome.